afternoon. Uh, my name is Ann Nicotera. I'm from the Department of Communication. I'll be moderating our session for today. I won't take a lot of your time. I'm very happy to introduce to you um, two friends and colleagues of mine who uh, work in, in the area that I work in. Uh, Janet Muir works through New Century College to provide students competencies in a range of core skills, including technology, through learning communities and collaborative teams. <coughs> recently been part of an initiative to offer workshops on new perspectives on retirement and is the mother, the mother of two teenage digital natives. Star Muir spent seven years leading IT skill building efforts for students and faculty in the ITU and on returning to teaching has been adapting his writing intensive course for digital natives. At the last Mason Teaching and Learning with Technology conference, he presented a one-person debate about which is really interesting, and I know Star can do it, so I can do it. Uh, about whether our students are digital natives or digital morons. <laughs> he practices Tai Chi to try to keep his balance in a house with two teenagers, as also the parent of, of two digital natives. Uh, my, one of my son's first work, words was WWW. <laughs> um, I am thrilled to be able to introduce them to you to pre present on digital natives and transformative learning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we get started, could we go around the room and just have you tell us your name, where you're from on campus, and what brought you through the fog to this room <laughs> at this moment today? So we know who you are. <laughs> I'm Martha Souter. I'm with the Center for Consciousness and Transformation, which is sponsoring this event. So I'm here to be here. So if you need anything from me, just shout, give me a wave, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm John O'Connor, I'm uh, Director of Higher Education Program, teaching the New Century College Digital Immigrants. Uh, I'll close as a major. I'm Howard Bunkar, and School of Education Doctoral Degree, and uh, in Educational Technology. And actually, I joined this group like the end of the spring semester and a couple times over the summer, but some things came up like the first one to just come back. So Good. the topic is fun. Great, thank you. I'm Carla P. Cord. I'm a graduate student um, career switcher studying music secondary education now. And um, this is a really relevant topic to discussions that we've been having this week. Good. I'm Karen Miller. I'm also in the career switcher program. English, and um, as Paula said, we have had a discussion on this. I have two digital natives, so. <laughs> I'm John Forcelli. I'm in the Graduate School of Education with you guys, and I'm also teaching over the Great. Uh, I'm Jeff Steele, and I'm in uh, with these guys, <laughs> Graduate School of Education and the Research Program Social Studies. Okay. Hi, I'm Jeff Steele. Yes. <laughs> and um, I was really curious because I've had to use articles for meetings for other several years and then for years and years. Great. So you're the expert. You should be. No, 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 no. I, I am a lifelong learner. Great. And I just broke my computer now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Schumann. Um, I'm adjunct faculty in um, psychology and in School of Rec Health and Tourism. And I've gotten, I've been teaching for quite a while and um, have two digital natives myself. And I've become more and more interested in how technology is changing um, development, especially adolescent development and, um, and parenting. So, in, in a lot of different cultural contexts. Um, so, that's why I'm here and I'm just here to present. So, thank you. I'm Lynn Constantine. I uh, teach in the School of Art, and I'm co-chair of the Brown Bag Committee. So aside from my deep interest in this subject area, as somebody who is you know, always trying to figure out where technology fits into what I do, I'm also very lucky to, be, to have an, a constant excuse to take time to come to these. So I'm looking forward to today very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Heather Hare, and I work in the Center for Leadership and Community Engagement. Um, I also am an instructor in NCC, and I'm just part of your fan club. Looking forward to what you have to say. I'm Stacy Gunther. I'm also with the Center for Consciousness and Transformation, and 
and uh, very interested in this presentation. Next week, I'm working with the Mindful Living LLC, and next week I'm, I'm challenging them to have a technology diet week where they turn off all the technology as much as possible because I think that as for kids, it will work. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. It's more than a diet. I know. I think they're going to cheat. Yeah. I'm Thad Cardine. I'm with that group over there. I got ostracized. <laughs> But I have three young digital natives, and it's amazing how early it starts. Even my two-year-old will yeah. say things. I'm Sarah Spur. Uh, I teach the composition program sometimes, and I'm assistant director of writing class curriculum. And so I also have a digital native that functions age. <laughs> Although in some ways I sort of consider myself too, because I was a returning student, and that, that was. <laughs> Something I'm sure like, discovered my inner technique. <laughs> um, and that's what we jumped in. Um, so I'm very interested both in terms of teaching but also for myself and again it was always in that. I'm Beth Lee Spark Dustin. I work with Mark at the CCP and the PTA and I'm also helping a little bit space in the semester. Last week, 
during the storm. Did anyone lose their internet and cable? We did. Um, <laughs> and we were feeling really, we were sort of pouting at home because we lost internet and cable. And we have, uh, we're sandwich people, parents, because we have uh, my mother who lives with us was 93 and couldn't get cable and then our children who couldn't get access to the internet and cable and you know just kill us I mean it was just a, a terrible uh, good time there to be without and at the same time then we looked outside and realized that no one else on our road had electricity so we were feeling a little uh, you know chagrined about the fact that we were there with lights and heat and everyone else was in dark space and here we're pouting about our internet but what that does, it show, you know, how many of you felt disconnected when you couldn't get power or you couldn't get on the internet, felt maybe isolated, a little disconnected? Maybe you were celebrating having that peace and quiet. Uh, maybe the next day you went back to your email and had 150 messages, right? So we, we get punished sometimes for turning off and shutting down. Um, that's another question I have. Anyone have technology with you at the moment? Bring it out. Let's see it. Expose yourselves. <laughs> Let's see how wired in we are as a community right now. Let's see. Do I have my children? Just walking through the uh, just walking through the Johnson Center to get here, I noticed every table had a cell phone. The student sitting there said so cell phone is certainly within finger reach. Laptops everyone right and how what do we have here you have two devices nice okay and it's blinking <laughs> which is an interesting thing because some of the research talks about you know that blinking light is so important because that tells especially a kid that someone's at the other end wanting to talk to them and that blinking light is like a, I got to do it now I can't leave that alone right so, don't answer that blinking light. So. <laughs> John Goldsmith, he still wears a watch. There you go. How well, many of you still wear a watch? I know. Mike have died. This, this, this is my watch. Right? Yeah. Uh, what other technology? Anyone have a laptop with them right now? Oh, there we go. Okay. I know what I've asked to do. And, and see how thin that is? It's just like, it's, you know, we have no books bigger than that, right? <laughs> Um, I don't want one of those. <laughs> uh, I know when I've asked students to do this, they bring out, you know, they'll fill the table and they've got matching laptops and cell phones and iPods, you know, and they're so wired in. How can we then expect them not to be thinking in that way or not to have some impact when you think about, you know, how closely connected we are uh, to the internet? And even ourselves, how this has evolved for us, where if our internet's down, we can't access computers, look at how much of our work doesn't get done. Uh, it's interesting, one of the um, uh, videos that's on YouTube that's gone viral now, a lot of people are watching, is a 1994 exchange between Katie Couric and Brian Gumbel. Has anyone seen that recently? Around the internet. Around the internet. <laughs> and they're so funny because they're saying, what is that A? Is that around or is that at? And that sounds really weird. NBC at, you know? And then they're saying, and what is the internet? What does that mean? And you, know, you think, oh my gosh, that was 1994. Now the very next year we started teaching uh, the first year program in New Century College in this building. And I remember students were so plugged in already to the internet that when we had them working on debates and the internet went down in this building because everything was still getting worked on, they freaked out. They could not do their research. And we said, there's a library. <laughs> you can walk right across the sidewalk to the library. And you know, all it just what that really showed is how quickly things change and how quickly we all have adopted, you know, this. So of course we know what the internet is. Look at how much this language has gone into our vocabulary. Everyone knows Facebook, we know YouTube, we know Twitter and so forth. So you know, the, the, uh, the research is now ex it really exploding in terms of thinking about all the kinds of impacts that this technology has on us. So what we want to do is spend a little bit of time, Stars actually has this advantage that he's been uh, really, really entrenched in the research because he's just been working on a book chapter. 
So he's going to talk about some of the literature uh, that is out there now. You see several of the books have been passed around. Uh, what some of the, the um, authors are talking about that have really been looking uh, more seriously at this idea of a digital native. And, and as you identify, well, maybe I'm sort of a native or uh, I'm an immigrant. Um, but there ought to be another word, too, mm -hmm. because we come to it, but there's quick learners, and then there are people that don't want to go into the technology. So you know, some of those words have to, I think, be uh, deconstructed a little bit more and really thought about. But we want to talk a little bit about the research, and then we're each going to share a little bit about some practices that we have done in our own classrooms. And then we really want to open it up to um, a couple of questions that we have for you all. So it's your turn. OK. Um, just a, a, a thing about my digital immigrant status, um, which is to say that um, I tried to describe a card catalog to my teenagers, and they just laughed. They could not believe it. You would have to go somewhere to another building and look at a huge array of little index cards, and we've come so far during um, their lifetimes. Um, the, the term that you may be looking for on one of the blogs, it says, I don't like digital natives, and of course there's, there's actually a lot of problematization of that term, but, um, but I prefer the, term, the terms visitor and resident. So are, are you a resident in the digital world, or are you a visitor? And, and I'm still a visitor. I, I don't live, I don't spend a lot of time online. Yeah. That's right. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I stay in first life, um, generally. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is that I am not wired to watch TV and do something else. I don't think this is a generational thing. She can do it. I can't. When I get, when there's a TV in front of me, I'm there. And when we go to any sports bars, Jeanette very strategically and cautiously tries to arrange it so that I'm not looking at a TV. In some instances, that's very hard to do. Um, we were in one recently where there was about a two foot uh, span all the way around, full. Um, and there's a place in Manassas that has four large screens against the completely consumed one wall. And so the digital world impinges on us in various ways. But I'm still not comfortable thinking of myself as a native. I want to. I want to just kind of briefly go through. Um, I have some books here that um, you're welcome to take a look at that are sort of the central books, um, and then the annotated bibliography you can peruse kind of at your. But I want to take you through three things. The first, um, what I would call beginnings, and we're going to start with Prensky, Mark Prensky. Um, he was the first one to coin the term or the phrases "digital native" and "digital immigrant," um, and a lot of. Um, He's taken a lot of heat um, from people, and I'll explain just a little uh, in, in a minute about that. But, um, but from where he started, noting that there was a disconnect between the media-rich environment that the children had in video games and in multimedia experiences, and in a classroom where they walk in and sit, and there is a talking head, and it's linear, right? He says that's really the, the makeup of um, a digital disconnect, and uh, he calls it the disconnect tragedy um, that, that's going to happen um, within, within our schools and our classes. Um, if you look at, um, on the first page, um, uh, is at the very bottom, um, Jukes, McCain, and Crockett have written Understanding the Digital Generation, uh, and they have a, a, an interesting chart where they're comparing, on the right-hand side, what educators prefer which includes slow and controlled release of information, text before, before pictures and sound and movement, information is provided in a logical, sequential way, students work independently before they network and interact, the teaching is just in case, which means just in case you need to know something about China history, that's what we're going to learn just in case you need to know something about, right? And, and so the students are left with this, well, somewhere, somewhere, I might need this information, right? That's the, the implication. And then delayed deferred gratification and delayed rewards and, and more memorization. On the other hand, Jukes et al. say, what digital learners want and prefer is information quickly through multiple information streams. 
processing pictures and sounds and colors um, and, and video necessarily be, before they get to a text that takes them through a linear stuff. Random access to, to hyperlink multimedia information. Networking simultaneously with others as you're working. Um, reminiscent of my children being on Facebook, listening to iTunes and doing their homework all at the same time. They want it all simultaneously. Um, learning just in time, just when I need it. If I need to know something in Excel, I want to go and learn that right before I go to my biology lab, right? So that I know it's just right there, just when I need it, instead of just in case. Um, of course, instant gratification, which many of us are teenagers have seen, um, and, uh, and learning that's somehow not only um, relevant, but, but real to us. Um, and so in his most recent book, um, what Prensky does is set up a partnering model, and he talks about it as very much in line with inquiry-based, challenge-based, case-based kind of learning, um, and, uh, and says <clears throat> he's in some ways trying to reassure teachers that while their roles have changed, there is still something very important for them. And he makes a distinction between the, the learning verbs that a teacher controls, think Bloom's questions or taxonomy, you know, do you, um, can you analyze, can you compare, can you um, reflect, can you um, research, can you evaluate, those are the kinds of verbs that teachers are responsible for, whereas students are really more in, in line with what he calls nouns which are the tools. Is it a wiki? Is it an instant message? Is it a, is it a cell phone call? Is it a PowerPoint presentation? Which, by the way, in case many of you don't know, PowerPoint is passe, right? Um, so, um, so there's this whole sense of, of newer kinds of technologies, um, and, uh, um, and the teachers don't have to track all of that technology. They need to set challenges and problems and issues to discover in a way that can, students can relate to and tap into their passions and, and get behind. And they need to set quality control on the product that analyzes, compares, researches, evaluates, etc. So he says there's still some very strong um, roles for teachers, but that they need to get back off of specifying every process and every technology that's used in the classroom and more in line with creating challenges and inquiries that will tap into student passions. Okay? So that's kind of the, the initial stuff. A little bit more quickly, on the extremes, um, uh, on, on, the, on the one hand is uh, um, Rushkoff, who writes a book um, back in, uh, I think, 94, um, that is then reprinted as Screenagers. Uh, and, uh, and of course, his view is that we are seeing the rise of chaos and the death, the, the fall of linear thinking, and who's going to lead us? The screen agers, through animism, and holism, and um, uh, consensual hallucination, and distance participation, and so forth. And so he clearly is in that you know utopian side of this is all great, and the screen agers are going to lead us into the future, right? Um, and then on the flip side is Bauerlein, the very first one, whose book, The Dumbest Generation. Um, is a little bit out of date, but nonetheless, he offers, he reviews um, uh, the um, engagement studies and a lot of the uh, test score studies and history and, and so forth, and, and what he finds is, is that fairly dramatically over the last 15 to 20 years or so, test scores have been dropping fairly constantly. Um, and he sees students know less geography, they know less history, they're less tied in. Um, and so, and, and he basically says it was the 60s and that generation of which some of you are a part of that damaged our educational system forever by opening up to what students are feeling and what <laughs> students need, right? And, and that sort of touchy-feely Bauerlein from the sort of Bloom-esque um, perspective says we're doomed and, and it's, and, you know, we're losing America's heritage. All right, that's the extreme. Uh, two more, two more things. Um, one is the distraction issue about so many myriad, you know, impingements on attention that students become distracted. And not only do they become distracted temporarily, 
but their brains become rewired so that they get dopamine surges when they scan and skip through multiple short, small, tiny bits of information. Right? Um, and, and this information, this kind of perspective, it was started with Oppenheimer, and I didn't bring Oppenheimer's book called The Flickering Mind, um, uh, but, but it's really come more recently in three major uh, books that have come out, iBrain, Surviving the Technological Alteration of the Modern Mind, just, if, I know this went around, but if anyone wants to take a look at it. Um, and then two journalists. Um, Ibrahim is written by a fellow who heads the Neuroscience Center, um, although it's a, not a technical book by any means. It's really for a lay audience. And Nicholas Carr and Maggie Jackson are both journalists. And Carr has written an article that was famous. You may have heard of <coughs> Google making us stupid. Um, and he writes here, based on his experience as a journalist, he says, after 15 years of heavy internet work, I find it hard to focus on a book project, a long project. It's hard to focus. My mind wants to flit and scan and skip. Um, and so um, he reviews a lot of the re research about our juggler's mind, um, and then um, and then ultimately concludes, you know, with Heidegger, hey, we're letting the frenziedness of technology into our soul. But he. He doesn't really go anywhere with it. He just says it's the shallows, right? People are skipping along the surface. He does talk about deep reading and the shift and the change in, in reading patterns that have occurred over, over um, a long time and what he calls the intellectual ethic of the technology. You know, the map did something for the way we think of the world. The clock did something for the way our society and our culture runs. And he says the computer has changed all the rules. Now we now books are being completely transformed, as many of you may have these electronic readers and so forth. So he does a lot of work on that. Jackson um, has the same kind of, we are losing focus, we are losing attention, we are all distracted, and she says, you know what? The loss of cultural heritage has been responsible for, and cultural memory has been responsible for most of the dark ages that we can point to. And she is not a neo-Luddite, but she is very concerned that, um, for example, 20 years now, we have a third fewer close friends than we did 20 years ago. We have many, many more friends on Facebook. But in terms of closer friends and closer, deeper relationships, we are losing that over time as we become more distracted. Um, and, uh, and, and so she has, she has some interesting things. She's very, um, she, toward the end, she really talks about the renaissance of attention. And that's where I'm going to focus the rest of my stuff. One last thing that's not really in here because I haven't gotten there, but there's a whole group of people that have been saying um, digital natives is a hasty generationalization. Um, and they basically, you know, say Prinsky is out to lunch because he assumes that this entire mass of young people coming through all have digital skills at a high level, um, and that is absolutely not true. And they do survey after survey in the United States, in South Africa, in Australia, in the UK, that, that really says we are still getting highly varied and diverse technology skill sets coming into um, college. So, um, so they kind of problematize the digital native um, uh, work a little bit. So there's an overview for you. I'll pass this along to Distracted. Um, and, uh, um, and, and let me tell you where I have gone, my self-report. And we'll shift now a little bit into the things that we're doing. Um, if, uh, if you want to pass those around. <clears throat> I'm focusing on transformative learning in, um, in sort of three ways. Um, some I have experience with and some I'm about to because I'm part of a, a, a cohort. But let me first say that transformative learning for digital natives does not always mean technology use. And I have to repeat that. It does not always mean that we use the cool new tools as part of our learning that we're adapting to digital natives. Particularly since I find distraction hypothesis fairly compelling. I watch my teenagers, and I know that they're distracted, and I watch my son struggling to sit down for 10 minutes and study. Now, he's a 13-year-old. Great salt here, folks. 
But on the other hand, uh, I, I do, and I used to read books. And I could stay in books all day long. And, and so I have a kind of a different hard wiring than my children do. My daughter luckily likes to read, so, you know. But my son, um, you know, has, has issues with that. So it's not always about technology, particularly since there are distraction issues. So let me identify three things that I've been doing. Um, I went to change my course, and here's what I found. I grew up in tell and test. That was the model that I learned in. And I still love that model. I'm dynamic. I'm face to face with the students. We're exploring the great questions of life. And, and, and after the class, I can usually say, wow, that was, that was a great experience. And I you know, walk you know, two inches off the ground back to my office, right? So, but, but I'm still in that digital immigrant sense of um, when I chunk my class up, I say, these are the chunks we have to have. And this is the order that they go in, and they have to do the reading in the books to get the knowledge content for that. So when I started saying, how do I change this? They're not doing the reading a lot. They don't like to listen to me lecture, even though I'm dynamic. And so what, you know, what, what do I do? And so what I came up with was um, the play sheets. Not a new concept. And not really technologically oriented. I take my lecture notes first thing is I decide what 15% do I want them to remember? Because if you've seen some of the literature, when you lecture to folks, that's about what they're going to remember. 15%. So that eased up a little bit on every little detail. Oh, they have to have this. They have to have that. They have to have this. And I, and I became less concerned with wide coverage and more concerned with what are the important things. And so um, who are the sophists and, and what do they do that impacted the development of rhetoric? I can tell them but instead, we did this yesterday. I say, everyone in groups, how many laptops are in the class? Eight hands went up. I said, make sure there's a laptop in every group, right? You have 20 minutes. I'm not giving them an hour to saunter through. You have 20 minutes as a group to go through and answer all of these. Go. There might be a couple that your textbook would help out in, but the rest of these, you're going to get off of the internet. And so they, they dash, they rush, you know, they have a timeline and they're working under deadline, right? And so at the end of that period of time, I say, okay, let's talk about what you found. And we go through these questions and some people answer them and I say, that's right, and I contribute what I know. And then some people say things that are wrong and I say, no, that's not my understanding. And I check them. If they come up with something that's a little aberrant, I'll say, how do you know? Where'd you, where'd you get that? And we talk a little bit about the sources of information that they're now relying on, that I'm validating in some way. And by the end, we have gone through and validated what they have discovered. And I've only used about 20 plus about 15, 35 minutes of my class. And they have covered what I would have spent an hour lecturing on. They got it in shorter chunks and we're, we're now ready to spend the remainder of my time showing YouTube clips, taking these concepts and applying them. You know, how do the proofs of ethos, logos, and pathos play out? Let's watch an Obama clip, or yesterday we watched, a, um, if you've ever seen the Nixon checkers speech, um, we watched a little bit of Nixon, to, you know, telling the people he wasn't going to give the little dog checkers back, right? So, um, so we, we talk about those things in application after they sort of discover things. And that's been a primary way that I've changed my course. I don't do that all the time. But I do it enough so that they know that they bring technology to class and they are part of our process, not always the correct part. <coughs> because I bring rigor and I bring, you know, pushing them on things into my practice. Um, but that's probably one of the primary ways that I've changed um, the, the foundations issue. And I tell them, option A, long boring lecture by your teacher. Option B, you get to sit around and figure out what some of these things are in a puzzle, and then we talk. And I can tell you their preference every time. Yeah. Option yeah. So, okay. So the flip side of this is the second place that I've gone, and this is exploratory because 
we're just starting this, and I've been sort of watching um, Mark uh, teach and get his curriculum together and work on the minor and stuff like that. And it's very, it's very insightful. And we're looking at books now that are talking about programs in different areas that concentrate on mindfulness. But to me, here's the nutshell. Incorporation of mindfulness practices into a wide range of classes is probably our best bet of preparing students, of giving them habits of mind that can help them fight off the fragmentia of our modern condition. They need to have somewhere, somehow, tools by which they can quiet their mind, still all the outside voices, and really begin to focus on something that is important to them. Maybe the class, maybe the family, or whatever. And so I have three options here about mindfulness that I have um, uh, recently been coming to. One of them is just, I do a weekly writing. It's just a visualization process. It just quiets them down. It says, take all those distractions. Take, take all that cell phone stuff. You can answer that later. It will still be there. You don't have time. Be here. Find a place that you remember where you are safe and you are comfortable and it is peaceful. Maybe you're listening to the rain curled up on the couch. Maybe you're watching something spectacular in nature. Find that place. Remember that place. And now as you come back to where we are now, here, here's what I want you to write about. Here's what I want you to focus on. And give me two or three things. Right? So that is, in a sense, giving them a, an exercise, a tool by which they can calm themselves. The second thing here is modeling approaches to technology. How many of you have ever found that you sit down to do something with the computer, and you look up, and it's five hours later, and you have simply spent five hours or however long time just whatever, browsing or stuff? I mean, I have looked up and go, oh my god, where did the time go, right? And I think that if we give the, the students tools to kind of um, approach limitations, and so there's some phrases here. When you turn on technology, when you bring it into the classroom, say, hey, we're very thankful for this technology, and we're going to use it for about 20 minutes, and uh, we hope it will deepen what we're talking about, and you'll learn more. That's just a mindful statement. And it says, we are here, and here is what we are about to use this technology for. Um, when ending technology usage, they thank you. And we're now turning this off, and we're moving into more discussion. Our presence here is more important. Same thing with the next one, which is when students are distracted because they're using, you know, they're watching the Green Bay Packers game in the back of the room on their, you know, laptop, or a lot of things. I see, you know, a fair amount of this because I'm inviting technology into my classroom. I'm saying bring it, right? But it has to be in service of the class. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, again, hey, we agreed we're going to limit outside technology use. Um, thank you for shutting down and closing your technology so you can be here with us. Um, and then the last one is uh, technology breakdowns. Instead of cursing the doggone thing and, and getting frustrated and showing all of that, say, hey, you know what? I'm really thankful for the technology here because it reminds us that we live in an imperfect world and that, the very important lesson, we control not the technology, but the attitude how you respond to things, much like, you know, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and, you know, other, other kinds of things so that talk about that attitude. We control that. And we don't have to flip out when there are problems with our technology. Uh, and then the last one here is uh, the reflective practice, um, which is just a kind of a, you did this, now reflect on it, which again is part of that mindfulness. And I'm going to turn the discussion over to Jeanette because she's done a lot more of that work than I so because in NCC, the students will say, all we do practically is collaborate and reflect. <laughs> but I think that that is a really uh, significant way to deepen, you know, and, and I think a lot of what we're trying to get at here is, is recognizing the kind of shallowness that's happening in the way that students, and all of us, 
access information. And so if we think about how do we begin to deepen this experience more and more for students um, that we deal with, and also in our own lives, how can we better um, handle our computers so that we don't get so stressed out when they're not working or when our electricity's out and so forth? What are some practices that we can do? And, and really remembering from the beginning that this is a tool. All of these things are tools that we use that should enhance our lives, not control. And yet, I think you see, especially with a lot of the students we deal with, that the technology is a very controlling thing. So what can we do? How can we uh, both model and practice things within the classrooms that will help with that? And those of you familiar with NCC, which is about half the people in here, uh, are very familiar with the importance of reflection. And, uh, Aston and Aston's book that we're going to be using in the learning community that talks about spirituality in higher ed talks about so many of the things that we're trying to do in New Century College. The value of service learning, experiential learning, reflective practice, things that I'm sure many of you um, also try to engage in. So I just want to show you one example that we're asking, you know, students don't get a lot of opportunity on campus, I think. Um, and the way they take classes, they're very uh, structured, bifurcated. They don't get much chance to really bring things together. And so what I'm passing out to you right now is an example of, a, of an assignment, just one assignment that we are really asking students to dig deep in their experiences. And uh, to give you a little back, bit of background, I'm teaching, hopefully tomorrow, if there's no snow, uh, <laughs> there will be, uh, NCLC 203, which is called Inquiry to Action. And our goal is to actually, um, you, know, you might have gotten the very last page of this copy there. Are no, there any extra ones? No. OK. Um, what we ask students to do in this class is to learn how to do research within a community setting and how to, uh, how to really engage in understanding how people come to know what they know and how do we go about finding out. And so they're really going to be working with community partners. But what we do about halfway through the semester is we have a pause and we want them to take a moment to reflect. Most of them have been in a first year program in New Century that uh, John teaches in. And Sylvia, you're, no, you're not teaching it. <laughs> uh, that some we have a lot of faculty involved in and this is the fourth class in the cornerstones and so what we want them to do here and it's it's a, a an assignment that also the other class that's running simultaneously this semester is doing as well is to give a student a chance to stop and really start bringing things together in ways that make sense because they are so segmented out this gives them a chance to really uh, create an electronic portfolio, which is what we do a lot of in New Century, but to stop and reflect on what they've learned, what key moments have really helped in that learning through the first semester and now where they are in the second semester, and really create a plan for the future. Now, how many freshmen are really asked to do that on campus? I, I, you know, not many. They may go to an advisor who gives them a plan, but really thinking about what's important to them personally and, and how that looks. And then we use a lot of technology in 203 uh, because we really do want to help students deepen their use of technology in ways that, that are meaningful. And so we use a program called Pebble Pad, which I know many people are familiar with. I know Heather, I think you've inspired me with, with your use of Pebble Pad. This is a, a tool where students can keep their materials over time and draw from them over their four years, their college career, and really they create, um, at the end, we asked NCC students and majors to create a final portfolio that reflects on that whole process. But this is a moment in the first year where we actually get them to stop and reflect a little bit. And let me see if I can put this up and show you one that I have permission to show. Start can you? Uh, yep. a little bit. Just to show you a quick thing of what this looks like. So this is a, a student who wrote about the road I'm on, and he has over here, step ahead, the newest technology, find an answer. He makes connections to various um, other assignments that he had in other classes. And so if we go here, we can see where he's now talking about. Um, here, he's talking about through Cornerstones, participating, became an active member. He's telling his story, and he's really had to go deeper than just 
you know, uh, responding to one isolated kind of assignment, and really make some connections across uh, many places. And then he's got the newest technology here where he talks about uh, one of our competency areas in New Century is information technology. We're actually calling it now in our own class information communication technologies because we think ICTs more uh, define what we're doing. But this is where then he has connections to various assignments that he's worked on. So this is, talks about the kind of analysis that he had to do in looking at qualitative and quantitative work. So the point being that he has had this opportunity now to really um, bring things together in a, in a pretty meaningful way for himself that begins to, um, to really look at what's important. And so he, he talks a look into the crystal ball. This is where he's talking about wanting to go into sports management and the things that he's going to have to do uh, to get to that point. Now, you know, a lot of classes will do uh, different kinds of reflective writing and, and things like that. But this is a really nice example of where students have had to just stop and, and think and go deeper in terms of some of the learning that they've had and make connections across many places. Um, you know, other examples, we have lots of different examples of experiential learning uh, that we do in New Century where they have to create learning objectives and really then respond to them. But again, it's that doing, it's getting away from uh, always needing to be in front of the computer and hands-on kinds of work that are deepening uh, their own kinds of practice. Um, just a quick little uh, thing about digital technology data I wanted to share that uh, this was captured last year and reported in um, New York Times and CNN.com uh, that youth between ages 8 and 18, seven and a half hours each day, they're engaged with some kind of electronic device. 75% uh, of youths 12 to 17 have cell phones. 83% take photos with phones. 64% share these digitally. 68% uh, call parents daily, which is nice. Uh, <laughs> 88% of young use mobile devices to send text messages. And you know what I'm doing different this semester is I have subscribed to broadtexter.com and this is a place where you can either send text or you can do it online and students can sign up to get alerts. Because you know what, they're not looking at email these days, right? You send an email and you think you're reaching them? They don't do that. Maybe you can find them on Facebook sometimes, but many people don't want to go there to have to do that. You know, the interesting thing about Facebook, just a quick aside, is that uh, some nights my son forgets to close down his Facebook. I am often shocked at the number of kids that are still up past 11.30 at night. I mean, he'll have 64 people still up ready to chat. Now, these are kids in middle school. They need to be in bed, right? Instead, they're, they're still on Facebook. And you know, many of them have said when they report about their technology use that they have all this time to do video. They don't spend maybe a little time on homework and they spend lots of time doing everything else. But the texting is an interesting one because if you want to find a way to reach them quickly, Broad Texter is now a program where you can send them alerts, they can, <coughs> they can read to go there and sign up and then if you have to cancel class, or you have to move a class or something, you just send them an alert. So anyway, those are just some examples. Of, oh, as far as the texting, 43% send text during classes, 33% send more than 100 texts a day. I know that's some of our children's use. So anyway, lots of stuff thrown out. We have about uh, 20 minutes for some conversation. Uh, so I wanted to start with maybe asking um, for those of you who have been teaching for a while, how have you seen students operating and have you changed it in your own practices in response to say um, their technology needs? So, anyone? Or if you don't want to go there, you can just respond to some of the other. You start encouraging them to bring in as much of the stuff as possible. But yet we, we teach them the backup stories. Because like I said, you can't forecast the weather for power out mm -hmm. unless you have unless you know how to do it manually. Mm -hmm. And so we try to blend it with okay, bring you feel free to have it all there at your fingertips and look at the data. But you better know how to do it on a paper with your brain. Mm -hmm. So 
we can stress a lot of backup, backups to backups, redundancy. Because yeah, all the stuff is really great until the battery dies. Right. When we teach navigation, we do the same thing. We still teach old school navigation. But yeah, that GPS is great until the battery dies. Yeah. It's one of the interesting findings of the, the people who are um, saying that technology is not as monolithic or deterministic as the digital native image would imply. Um, and, and one of the things they're finding is that, um, which you would expect and which uh, is validated by um, a variety of studies, is that they have relatively strong social media skills um, and they can find entertainment online. But the other kinds of tools that, um, like uh, spreadsheets or um, digital image creation kinds of tools that you find uh, fast students that are that are facile at doing that um, in one study was was less than than 14 percent and and that the, the rest of the, the students didn't exhibit that kind of you know deep sort of understanding and skill at particular tools that are more common in society than social media so, I, I, yeah. so they don't really, they don't, they're not developing the skills to really do research, just real research. Almost every book that's here says they need to learn better how to critically evaluate the information that they get. Um, now there are studies that show that they are skeptical. They, it's not that these people are stupid and they know that there is stuff on, online, but, but nonetheless, you know, there is some truth to the, the um, you know, uh, cars, Google is making us stupid. And the truth is that that's the first place they go. It's Wikipedia or Google, and that's the first place that they go when they do research. It's become a new library. Why do I need to go to the library? I have Google, right? Um, and, and, and who do they trust? They don't necessarily trust the experts. They trust their friends who have also validated, you know, some of what they're thinking. So, you know, a YouTube video will go around and, and it, our son will say, think it's exactly, you know, everything's true about it. And, you know, then we see students using Wikipedia, and I'll remind them, you know, my son started a Marvel comic entry on Wikipedia. So, you know, who's the expert here? So this sense of authority um, has, re has really shifted. I have a question on that. You mentioned those two specific places. But if they are focusing on those two different things, aren't they actually locking themselves into a narrow? location for information because both of those are very heavily controlled and I've built websites you pay Google and you arrange to have your stuff coming first that's if right. they're, they're doing research using a search engine like that they're limiting themselves to what some other authority has said this is, should come up at the top of the search right. and the stuff that they really may need may never show up because it's been pushed a lot well, I do make it a point of modeling yeah. for them going to the library databases and opening up Elsevier or, or one of the others and just really showing them that, you know, you have a privilege right now that you may not be aware of. Because you are a student at this university, you have access to research that other people have to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars to get. Um, and so, you know, just to show them SAGE publications or to show them um, some of the science databases that are available for that makes, you know, it makes it, because I think we have to combat that. We, you know, we, as teachers, you know, we have to kind of say to them, Google isn't going to do it for you, Wikipedia's not going to do it for you. So, so can you say modeling, though, you're, you're just explaining, I mean, what, what do you mean by what you say modeling? Well, um, if, if we're talking about something in class, and an issue comes up about you know what what is happening on this issue. I, I will often go into the library databases right there. Instead of typing a Google search in, I'll go into the databases and say, here's a really good one. You know, da 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 da, -da, -da. And, and it opens their eyes to the fact that a position of authority is saying, here's some really rich resources, and they're free to you, and it's so, easy. To think is what you're doing is modeling cognition and not metacognition, right. which is very valuable if you tell them why you're doing each step. Right. That would be a lot more uh, Right. More I'm going here because yeah. Google doesn't or rather, work for me. Rather you say, okay, this is the question, and which way I go, I can I make this decision, so then I'll go to that. Because that's the whole idea. 
Right, and, and actually that's what we do in the um, Inquiry to Action class. We have a day that we talk about how to do research and, and we say Google's not enough. You're used to doing this as a, as a product, a process. Let's start, well, let's look at Google Scholar, okay? Now let's look at the library databases. We're going to be taking them through a whole bunch of stuff on that day with tools along with the same, with, you know, how, how to cite, how to manage, all of these things. But it's not just show. I agree with you. But it's not just showing your model. It's just behavior. Yeah. So, um, my caveat is I do subscribe to pretty much most of the you. Know, however, I also like to play devil's advocate, which is what I'm hearing as listening to your language. We want them to. We want them to. We have to combat. So as I'm listening to people talk, it's like, well, we need to be fighting this somehow because we think this is bad. And that's fine. But I'm also not hearing perspectives you know, from digital natives. Um, I heard an NPR report recently about uh, uh, strong, strong gamers and how, in fact, their multitasking skills and their focus was better than people who had learned it more traditionally even with some technology. So I also think not just about this generation, but the next generation, the generation after that. I don't know how their brains are going to be, have been rewired. Um, but it's possible. So I feel like we're still looking at it from our fairly old school perspective of research is important and this is the way we do it and you need to do, you know, there needs to be reflection of deep learning. I'm not saying there doesn't need to be. At the same time, I kind of am not hearing the voices from those who, you know, a little bit further down the line, haven't had a whole lot of that, and yet they're still functioning members of society. They may have some tremendously wonderful jobs, um, be fulfilled, be innovative, be making lots of money, be doing all of the things that we would think of them as being productive members of society and citizens of the world. I think that's a good point. Krensky has another book called Not Now, Mom, I'm Learning. And it's all about video games producing decision-making kinds of skills. And, and uh, I don't think he addresses the violence issue very well. But, um, but he does say, you know, we have to open up to the possibility that, you know, the way we're seeing things, which is kind of why I start off by saying, I have a thick accent, right? I, I am an admitted immigrant. And so it, it is, you know, I, I am saying to, um, um, to people, in my view, I think that we should be looking at incorporating some of these practices because I see, and some of the research is suggesting, that there are issues with some of their habits of mind um, and, and uh, McThinking, as uh, uh, Jackson puts it, but yes. Um, there was a really interesting article in the Wall Street Journal within the past three weeks, and I, I'm never going to remember the name of this woman, but there's a woman who is at UC Berkeley who is researching gaming, and I thought it was fascinating. It really shifted my perspective a little bit in the direction of what you're saying. Um, and she she talked about how several, um, several people are beginning, gaming is so intense in focus and attention that there are a number of people who are presenting problems, like problems to be solved to gamers and asking for intense problem solving on gaming and they gave like three examples one of which was some kind of manipulation of a visual image that had to do with genetics and DNA and they put it out to the gamers because they really felt that gamers could come up with solutions faster than supercomputers and they proved them right so they put it out there as a puzzle to solve visually and gamers came up with many many solutions very very quickly Another one that she came up with was like the global, the global village where they had to um, look at a set of circumstances in developing nations and solve problems. And one of the solutions to the games was this traveling libraries that is now actually being used and brought to places in Africa that have very limited resources in terms of books. And this was created in the game. And I was, I was sort of flabbergasted because I think I have brought some of the old school attitude of this is changing everything, this is changing development, and my book club has had really interesting discussions. A number of the women are about 10 years older, and they have this deep suspicion of technology. And I just keep thinking, we really have to broaden and change, open our attitudes to how this may be changing us. I know it's changing our wiring. I see it in my kids, and they're multitasking. I even see it in my husband, who's been you know, a technologist for years and years and years. I mean, the many things that he can attend to. But it's, I think we bring this, attitude that it's not good 
And I think that we have to really open up. You know, the notion that we could solve incredible, difficult problems through gaming, because supposedly the areas of the brain that are engaged during gaming are the creative, fun-loving, they don't get stuck because there's a solution somewhere if we just keep playing. And the idea that play can be a problem solving that may be more in fact effective. It was, it was really fascinating. I, I, I will try to find the source and this, this woman's research because it was really very interesting. But I, I do think we have to watch what, uh, what attitudes do we bring in you know, as the and, immigrants. You know, and I, I agree. I mean, I think in so many ways, technology, I love technology. I use a lot of it in my classes. And what I, I think the message that we need to walk away with is that we can't teach in the same way as we always have. That there has to be some transformation in, and I know that there are people who feel like they have to be the sage on the stage, or they have to have a PowerPoint that has everything that they're gonna say, and then they look at the PowerPoint the whole time, right? And so we have to be aware that Technology's not going anywhere, right? And and I love it. I mean, we have more computers than TVs in our homes. So we're right there with it. And we know that there's a lot of, of value. There's also, we have to be mindful of, you know, how is it changing the ways that we interact with one another? How often do we send emails to someone who's like right next door? You know, that kind of human interaction is something we have to be thinking about, you know, what's happening with that as well. So so I agree, I mean, I think that there's um, wonderful uses and it can be transformative. And, you know, you look now at these, um, my, my um, uh, investment club just uh, invested in these surgical robots that are just amazing how they're able to do now surgeries that no human could actually do. And, and so there's so many great things that, that are happening, but at the same time, then how do we teach, you know? teaching in the ways that I, I know I can't teach the same way I did even, you know, 10, 15 years ago. We have to be different. We have to try different things. And uh, and so that's where some of the assignments we're getting at was trying to talk about that. Right? Yeah, and one of the complexities of all of this is that we're talking about, you know, developing human beings. And so, yes, that there, are, there are many positive things that can be happening, but there also it remains the responsibility of the adults to find to 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 help guide the process of development in ways that may not interfere with the development of these you know wonderful new things, but that also you know are based on a on you know a, a, a set of always the evolving values. You know the val you know I, I think about this the studies that have been done that have have shown a, um, a decrease in the uh, development of empathy mm -hmm. uh, among the younger people. And you know, whatever else we may want them to be, we know that no one can really live a happy life as a human being without the capacity for empathy. And so you know, part, of the, part of the challenge is figuring out how to use new things to develop values that you know are not are simply not going to change, like the value of empathy. And one of the things that I love about the way that New Century uses reflection is that part of the process of developing empathy is developing empathy for oneself, and that requires that reflective process and an ability to quiet so that you can indeed reflect. So it, you know, it's it, it's just tremendously complex to think about the role of the, of the elder in all of this, mm -hmm. while at the same time being positive and, and you know, forward thinking. You see, that, you see that strong voice, the elder voice, adult voice, particularly stridently in like barrel lines of the dumbest generation. Yeah, right. We know what they need to learn, and they're not learning it, and it's very paternalistic, and so right. it and just rubs me the wrong way. But, you know, the iBrain book there is very much into, um, they provide a, um, a, a scientific rationale for why students at, at a time when they are teenagers and are learning to appreciate and take other points of view, 
don't develop that skill as strong when they are immersed in video games and multimedia distractive environments. Um, and so um, their argument is actually that the, the education should be teaching what they call basically social skills 2.0. That students should have a curriculum which teaches them how to listen, mm -hmm. how to see things from other points of view, and so forth. And, and you know, being in communication, of course, we're like, you mean teach good interpersonal communication <laughs> skills? You know, <laughs> -hoo, you know. Um, but but I think you know, I I guess the the, the thing about the the gamers is that um, there it's just it's just uh, from my point of view as an immigrant, it becomes a double-edged sword. I believe, uh, like I was a debate coach for a long time. Mm -hmm. Debate is a wonderful training for the mind. But there were people that came in, got debate, had the wonderful experiences, did a lot of learning, and then plateaued. Mm -hmm. And they, they really weren't getting much more out of their interaction, you know, maybe socially or something like that. And, and I think that happens sometimes with gamers. I think that, you know, with my son, after about the first solid, you know, 250 hours playing his video game, um, I, I would say that he's reached a lot of the potential that he's going to get from that game. And what remains becomes more addictive, more compulsive behavior. If there's conflict in our family, he goes to the video game, right? If he wants to get away from his grandmother, he goes to the video game. And, and so, you know, to my mind, it's, I think, I really do, I think there is great value. I, I mean, I subscribe to Games Magazine, and, you know, I love playing games and other kinds of stuff, and so I'm, I'm really into that cognitive, like the nuns, you know, keeping their minds working, doing puzzles so that they don't experience Alzheimer's later in disease. For me, it's way too late, you know, the memory is gone. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but, but at the same time, I also know that there is an obsessive, compulsive side of that game um, that, that, as parents, I kind of feel like, you know, I need to show you how I can put limits on my technology use so that you learn that and you can say, okay, I have time for one hour. That's what we're going to do, you know, as opposed to, you know, looking up at four o'clock in the morning and saying, oh, it's four o'clock in the morning. Holy cow, how did that happen? So, anyway. No, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, and listening to this, my, my heart is beating really fast. About teaching social skills. <laughs> and I'm looking at some of the little suggestions here, and some of it's just the type of people that's been around for a long, long, long time. Right. And much of it came out of uh, psychology research and social education research. You know, we're all looking at it. Because that's material with more than one modality. That's been around forever. Right. Um, and just, um, and, some, and you talked about having your students reflect. And children in special education programs or required schools are required <laughs> to help them transition. And part of the transition is uh, learning how to analyze your strengths in uh, issues, if you will, and um, getting hopefully a sense of how your uh, I'll say disability, if you want to know that word right now, uh, impacts your life and how the strengths that it brings with it, and then how you how you can capitalize on your strengths to be a contributing member of society. And so many of these pieces, it, I just find it interesting and fascinating from this perspective to see it incorporated in people. So there's some very interesting, the, the work that um, uh, on, on contemplative practices, um, there was a section, I think it's in iBrain, or it might, it might be in, in, in Jackson, where she talks about, um, you can train attention. Uh, you know, there's a whole sort of contemplative tradition about training attention, but even with, you know, Torkel Klingberg, who's one of the big brain researchers that gets cited a lot, um, you know, he's, he sets up this, this uh, software game, and it trains students to pay attention, to increase the time with which they can bring focus onto it. And so it may be that, you know, there are immersive um, qualities of technology that can help us stay focused and can train students to, to pay attention, you know, longer and with greater um, um, sort of willingness, you know. But 
Um, I'm not sure 13 year old boys are ever going to enjoy sitting down in one place, you know, listening to one person talk at them, you know. Um, uh, so I, I don't know how all that goes, but but I do, but I do believe, and this is be my my embarking on this project for the next you know year or so. But I do believe that for the long view, the digital native generation is going to be around for a very very long time. I mean, we still have baby boomers, and how long ago did that whole thing start? And, and so to me, I think I'm interested in ways to give students little techniques, I don't want to call them tricks, but, but little ways that they can take with them in their life so that when they come to a place where they are absolutely up against the wall, and have, have started to lose touch with reality because of all, I think, honestly, with all the multitasking and stuff, they're gonna, there's gonna be a piper to pay. I, I really strongly believe that. That's my, that's my immigrant background. But somewhere along the way, when you are a parent, uh, uh, Ibrain talks about continuous partial attention, which is what we have, and many of us experience for a long time. Somewhere along the way, you start getting fatigue, distractedness, your ability to do tasks goes down. You, it, think of sitting on a couch all day watching TV. And when you get up from that, it's like you're cranky, you're irritable, right? You, you've just had you know, too much of that. And so I think that it is important for educators looking at this new age um, and, and these new environments that we're working in, that we try and bring to them ways to develop habits of mind that can help them cope and maybe even help the gaming have limits and be more productive, right? So, okay, I'll shut up. Yes? Yeah, um, I actually had a question about, um, you were talking about the obsessive compulsiveness and in the technology being immersed and stuff. And, um, I mean, my perspective, you know, it's only a problem that depending on the individual, and you were talking about you know, the, the obsessiveness and your son running over to games and stuff like that. I have a 16 and 17 year old brother, and he does the same thing. Um, and so, um, for me, to me, that's more of like an avoidant personality kind of problem. And so, maybe, in my perspective, you know, of course, technology is impacting, you know, so many of our lives. You know, my mother is still like trying to figure out texting. Um, but you know, also maybe you put an in focus maybe on the individual and figuring out what kind of personalities they have. Um, some people may have more addictive personalities. Well, your son may run to video games. Others, you know, an adult, they may self-medicate through, you know, vodka or some people prefer video games and um, all that stuff. So I just kind of want to put that out there. There is a whole section in Jackson about ADD and ADHD. Um, and the, the somewhat um, now, and we're, we're getting into areas where we have much more specialty in the room than myself. But, but some of what's, what's interesting about that is that they have found that through some technologies, they can train children to pay attention for longer times. And that when they do that, um, that there are less behavioral problems, that there are less um, social issues that they encounter and stuff. And so, you know, I, I, I do think the issue of, you know, finding ways for them to help focus and to help um, pay attention to things even while they're still living their lives and have all these distractions. I think that may be the great challenge of, of the next you know, 10 years, 15 years or so. 